Howdy. Uh, thank you, first of all, to the incredible TEDx organizers for making the colossal mistake of inviting me to do a talk. <laughs> um, thank you again for the wonderful dinners and everything and allowing me to write my speech five minutes before this happened. Um, so what I came here to talk about is alternative futures in scientific funding. One big theme that we definitely want to talk about is that scientists are, are people too. Um, for example, um, we're not just all out there in an, our wonderful ivory towers, which are very difficult to build, to be up there and, and try to come up with ideas and we're very separated from the public. We're very much people with mistakes and personalities and other weird things. Um, one good example, uh, my office is right next to one of the most famous evolutionary thinkers of all time right now. Um, and he was walking by my office, my office door was open, I was working on some data. So he waves and says hello, and I waved and burped instead. <laughs> and that's a humanizing thing that I think a lot of scientists can say, yeah, I'm a weird person. Um, so this is gonna be a theme that we're gonna come back to in that people are, are normal and we're human and we have questions that we wanna answer and we wanna be interactive with different communities. Too far. Okay, so one thing as scientists and not just people that we want to identify is what kind of problems do we face? Uh, for a lot of us in the scientific community, that means trying to get grant money and trying to get money to actually further our projects and answer those questions. So one thing that we often have trouble with is how do we get that money? Um, one big thing that we do is often we write grants. So when you write a grant, and we've done this before, you write up this huge proposal and you talk about all the different things that you want to do and you need to scrutinize everything that you've done because it will then be scrutinized by a peer review process. And that's the way most science is done. So we wrote a, a grant proposal to the NSF and we put it in and everything was going great and then the government shut down. We were like, oh, well, that was fun and uh, <laughs> we didn't know what to do then. So it, it ended up that you know, government money was so short already and even though we were on a high priority invite, we were very disappointed to see that the time that we had expected that money to come in had already gone by because of the government shutdown. So for people who don't get grants or they miss their opportunity, what can they do in the meantime? Uh, so for applying for an NSF grant, one of the new stipulations is that you now, you cannot just submit a proposal. You now need to submit a pre-proposal to be invited to submit a proposal. So you need to have an idea that's a shortened version of your shortened version to present to people. There's about a 20% chance of you getting selected to move on to the next group. And from there you have a 15% chance of actually getting an, an award and getting the money that you had requested. So this comes out to about a 3% funding rate, which is terrifying. So, and that's 3% of projects that get funded. And you may have say less than 300 projects get funded in the US every year for my field. Uh, spread that out amongst the 4,000 plus universities that are applying for grants and you realize not many people are getting that grant money. And these aren't things that I'm suggesting that everyone should not do the grant process. I think it works really well for certain huge projects. Like if we're looking for a cure for cancer or a way to treat Alzheimer's, those are projects that require millions of dollars and you can't just do a Kickstarter for them and say, yeah, we raised 50,000 bucks because that is one day in one of those labs. And all that time effort has been essentially wasted on, on just one quick burst of energy. But for there are some projects that I think are very small and we can identify those projects and say, can we fund these in a different way and also try to involve the community? What I mean by that is that NSF, for example, now necessitates that you have a broad impact section of your grant. Broad impacts means that besides what you're doing, what are you gonna do for the community at large? So are you going to teach high school kids? Are you going to develop a module for colleges? that will then be involved with your research and how will you apply those? So is there a way to integrate NSF's broad impacts or any other grants far-reaching opportunities into these smaller projects and maybe build a community structure to do that? Oops. So one thing that we have already done is we'll go out and do talks at different colleges. So uh, we have a friend, one of my colleagues is a falconer and she knows a whole bunch of amazing falconers. They're all wonderful people and scientists as well at Cornell and, and Binghamton University as well. Uh, and they were able to lend us, uh, this is Meg. She's a Jir Saker Falcon. And we were able to bring her out to um, Syracuse University and SUNY ESF. 
and have an amazing talk with her and, and get involved with the wildlife societies and all these other people. But even having this out, and people really enjoyed it, and I think Meg enjoyed it too because she was eyeing all the songbirds that were flying by, being like, I'm going to eat you. Um, it was really cool because you get to really like get people involved and have, build an intimate connection with people. So they were really interested in what we were doing, and they were vested in our project. And we thought, you know, is there a way to do this on a bigger scale to involve more people or target those communities so we can get a bigger effect? So we had a few other projects. Um, Kickstarter, for one, is, is one of the really promising things. But it's a little different than what you want to do for science because it has a, a promise. Um, with Kickstarter, you're promised a gift. Um, so if you donate to it, you're getting something back in return, literally a tangible thing. We are collaborating with uh, Dr. Tiffany Taylor in the UK and David Sloan Wilson here, who's an evolutionary biologist uh, that you guys may have heard of if you're at Binghamton University, collaborating to make a book uh, for children about evolution called Great Adaptations, which is the most clever name and I wish I came up with it. Uh, so just, a pre just think about it for a second and be like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, Great Adaptations is a really interesting project collaborating with all these different people and it's an international effort um, with you know, the Max Planck Institute in Germany and all these really great places and people. Um, and I'm humbled to work on the project, but the way Kickstarter works is, again, if you say give us 20 bucks, you're gonna get a copy of the book. A science Kickstarter is different because you're promising data and no one's like, yes, an Excel spreadsheet. You know, no one's like super jazzed about that. It's really cool for us and it's interesting for other scientists but to try to get people involved is a little different. Um, one thing that we want to do is maybe try to connect with people in a, in a bigger way and say, okay, can we do something that interests the people themselves and they want to donate and see that data for themselves? So what we thought about was if you look at citizen science data, uh, there already are communities that are involved in, in these big collaborative efforts. So this is a, a screenshot from a program that maybe some of you guys know. This is called eBird. Uh, eBird is put out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Cornell University, and you can literally submit all of your little birding info, and if you go out in the morning and you and just enjoy looking at birds, you can write down your list and then submit it. And this may not seem like a big deal, but I mean, if you get several million uh, different lists, this becomes a real huge data set. Unfortunately, you have people like me who are real dumb, and they're putting out things that may not be accurate data. So these are the downsides of that kind of, of sourcing is that you lose some of the quality control. Similarly, if you do a Kickstarter for science, you're missing out on the integral peer review process. But one thing that is good for this is that even though the data may not be perfect, you can look at it as a way to say, okay, we see some interesting trends here, and maybe not everyone is dumb. Everyone is pretty good if you put them all together. So when you put them together, you can at least target areas that will be better used for real research. So you may say, okay, we know these target areas. We'll write a grant to look at that area and target it a little bit more specifically. So using existing um, of, uh, citizen science is really interesting for targeting it and also realizing which communities may be interested for your projects. So we continued to do some outreach. Um, this was part of the project that we eventually ran and we had done a few different things. So we were out looking at bird communities in Ithaca, New York. So we were out there tagging American crows, Corvus brachyrhynchos, and we were out there teaching uh, other students how to band birds. So we would capture the birds and then uh, put tags and, and U.S. Uh, fish and wildlife bands on them and show them how it was done. So for future field biologists and other people that are interested, or interested in ornithology as, as a whole, how they could actually do this in the future. So people were really interested in that, and that builds a whole lot of interest. So talking to these people and building up a rapport was something that I thought was really, really unique. And you can see people really enjoyed it. I mean, people would come out and, and really crows aren't the most loved animal in the world. Uh, they're a gigantic black ominous bird that eats corpses. Uh, but they do lots of other interesting things and are wildly intelligent. So people learn all these other aspects that they didn't realize and then suddenly they have a vested interest. So there were people there that were like, well, I don't want to study bird, uh, I don't want to study crows, I want to study this really beautiful exotic bird. But then as they realize that they have a vested interest in birds that are in their backyard, they become much more intimately involved and suddenly it's their project. So that's what we really, really, really wanted to, to do. So 
we thought about this and we thought, is there a way that we could reach more people and get a bigger reach than just our general area? Um, that's where I sort of came in and turned my procrastination on other online sites into something that was interesting. Um, so if anyone's been on Reddit, good for you, <laughs> good job. Um, it's a great way, for people who don't know, it's the premier place for new cat photos. If you really want to see an adorable animal doing something cute, that's the place to go. So I started off there kind of just wasting time. But eventually, I would start answering biology-related questions and eventually got into some of the science subsections of the, of, of the site and realized that I could build a rapport with these communities that existed. There are birding communities, ornithological communities, broad science communities on there that I was able to interact with in a real way and kind of get their input on things. And similarly, there's some really strange communities out there. <laughs> so when I, was put, when I was putting this slide together, I was like, am I really gonna put this in a PowerPoint slide and deliver this? Yeah. <laughs> so what this is for those that are utterly confused right now, this is what is called the Doge meme. It's a corruption of the word dog, you see? I was like, I'm gonna have to explain this to people in the audience, it's gonna be real weird. So basically this is, became an internet meme um, that just got so hilarious and popular that it eventually became a cryptocurrency in and of itself. And all it is is silly dog photos. But there's a community there that is ridiculously involved in and of itself and they've put an outpouring into saying like, let's promote this ridiculous idea and make it insane. So they've funded all kinds of strange projects. Um, they recently quite literally redid Cool Runnings <laughs> and funded with cryptocurrency $129,000 to, to the Jamaican bobsled team to send them to Sochi Olympics. Um, it sounds insane, but they've done other amazing things as well. Um, they worked recently to sponsor a NASCAR team that just didn't have a sponsor. And on the actual side of things, they've worked with UNICEF and they're working to provide uh, third world countries and the kids that live there with clean drinking water access. So they've done incredible things. And when I told them, I had talked to a few people uh, in the community if they'd be interested in, in promoting science and science education, and they had a huge outpouring. But what's interesting is that it's different from just saying, okay, here's five bucks. They're able to put this together and like, like the previous person who had spoken about, uh, Jeff had spoken about Bitcoin, there's no transaction fees that are really sizable. So a bank transaction fee might be 20%. Where a for a Bitcoin or for a Dogecoin, it could be fractions of a penny. But even the people that were sending us literally fractions of a penny, they'd be like, oh, I'm gonna send you 20 Doge, which is like 0 .006 cents or something like that. Um, they still had a vested interest in these projects. And they would check up with me to see how things were going. And it was bizarre because we were like, we're getting funded by dog pictures right now. <laughs> and we, we raised thousands of dollars this way. But we reached a whole community of people that had never interacted with the outside world in a way that kind of meant something to them. You know, they had, they had seen BBC documentaries about animals that they'll never see, but they had never questioned the animals in their backyard. And I think that's where we really, really want to go. So we had our experiment.com, uh, which is the kind of the Kickstarter for science, and there's others like Petri Dish um, that allow you to do this kind of thing. And they've raised, you know, I know experiment.com is, is still in its infancy, but it's raised nearly a million dollars in scientific funding already, which is amazing. So they were able to uh, collaborate and do experiment plus Dogecoin, such collab, wow. Many science, <laughs> <laughs> such fiduciary investment. Um, <laughs> So these guys were like, yeah, this is a great idea, why not? And basically you get a collaboration of ridiculously small amounts reaching lots and lots of people and you can do really great things. So we did an AMA uh, with our Crow Research Group and talked to all kinds of people. Um, people that had no vested interest before but now were suddenly getting questions answered that were just kind of curiosities. And then they would donate a couple cents or even a couple bucks and then some people would throw us thousands of dollars that you would just never reach otherwise. Um, so I suggest that everyone should interact with these communities and try to get their ideas funded in a really interesting way and interact in a way that brings people together and gets them involved to think about things that are important to them. And if you can do that and you can reach these people and, and try to get them invested in you, then that builds the future of funding. And you can get people to repeat this again and again and try to come back and then become scientists themselves, 
even if it's only a small proportion of those people. Um, and being able to, to get people to interact with the world around them and realize that there's a lot out there and that they can build questions and even try to answer them, even if they can't get answers from other people, they can do these small projects and get answers themselves. It's something that I'd really like to see for the future of science. So thank you very much for having me.